So welcome everybody. Hopefully, first of all, well done for joining the eve of Passover. I'm sure everyone has got the super stress, Yetzirah, satanic stress of, of pre-Passover disease. Should be like an illness called pre-Passover illness. Um, from a spiritual perspective, it's actually connected to the notion that when we, before there's a very big holy moment, like before you get married, before a Shabbat, Satan is allowed to attack you and to allow to get you in, get you stressed and get you, God forbid, going into Passover, angry with someone, upset, um, or whatever that may be. And, and that is so important, my friends, that even if something happens to kind of rub you up the wrong way, someone says the wrong thing at the wrong time, someone's mean, someone's, there's tremendous stress, just stay calm. Count to 10, stay chilled, expect the balagan, expect the craziness, and, and don't allow yourself to get into a negative spiral. And then hopefully you can walk into Passover with a smile on your face, with joy, and then you're ready to receive the downloads in the best possible way. So that's advice number one. Advice number two, before we get into the Haggadah, and Sezi and I, just, just to quickly repeat, even though most, most of you were with me last week, just very quickly repeat, I put on my WhatsApp and I put on my Facebook, my selling of chametz form, if anybody would like to sell their chametz. For example, one of the reasons, I'm sure lots of you have whiskeys. Whiskey is pure chametz. Lachaim, everybody, lachaim, lachaim, lachaim. That's why I'm very meticulous to finish all my whiskey before Pesach. I don't just trust in selling them. I need to keep drinking them, so lachaim. And for those of you who are gonna sell their whiskeys and not be trying to become totally drunk over the next 48 hours, then selling chametz is very important because one is not allowed to drink one's chametz post Passover that we owned over Passover. So that's why we all sell our chametz. It doesn't mean someone's going to come into your house and start licking your food. It doesn't mean that. It just means that legally it's not yours. It's just not yours. And therefore we're not transgressing that verse in the Bible, which says you can't own your chametz. Also, tomorrow night you're going to be doing the searching, the, the, the deepest chametz. And then you're going to do the nullification. And Friday morning, we do the burning of chametz. And therefore, we're able to walk in to say tonight, totally free of all chametz, please God. Okay. So then what is the focus is for say tonight? So first of all, just before, you know, to kind of the, the we've called this the, like a, a pre-Pesach preparation. So you need to make sure you have your matzah. And it's very interesting for those of you who can't afford matzah. First of all, message me and I'll be happy to try and find you some matzah, number one. But even if, God forbid, someone couldn't afford it, that is something that's worth almost selling their clothes for. That's, it's that important. Matzah is, is that important. One needs to do whatever we can to, to make sure you have your matzah. Ideally, what's called shmura matzahs, matzahs, which not just like your average matzah box on a shelf, but what's called shmura matzah, matzah, which were made specifically to have first night seder in mind. Called shmura matzahs. And have your wines. Ideally, it should be red wine, even though my wife does like her white wine. But really, of all the nights, red wine is the wine to, to focus on on Seder night for many Kabbalistic reasons. And then and have your Haggadah. Have your Haggadah. By the way, if anyone doesn't yet have a Seder to go to, message me again and see if I can help arrange wherever you are in the world. I'll try and find a way to try and find you to get to a Seder night. Because... No one should be alone on Seder night. Okay, let's go. I told you it's Kabbalistic fee. You're not, you're, not, you're not 40 yet. You can't start learning Kabbalah too, too young. Okay, here we go. Seder, everybody. So first of all, the, the, the number Seder. The word Seder. Anyone know what does the word Seder mean? Please message in. The word Seder means... The word Seder means, my friends, order. It means order. Like in the... Um, House of Commons, they say order, order. So they're saying Seder, Seder. So why is Seder order? So it's a very deep question, actually. The Sfas Emes, the great mystic Sfas Emes, asks, how can it be that the night, which is the most bonkers, disorderly night of all? You know, those of you coming to me for Seder, you're not even going to get fed till about midnight. And and because we do a lot of stuff prior to that, that's why James is happy he's not coming to me. And, and um, it's a night where I'm going to be wearing a white kittel. I don't do that apart from Yom Kippur. 
Um, it's a night where we're going to be having Mora. Not, we never in our family normally have lettuce, so it's going to be very interesting. Not only is it lettuce, it's meant to be bitter lettuce. Who has bitter lettuce? Who has matzah? Who has matzah leaning to the left? It's a night of total manish tana halayla azeh. We're going to get into soon. It's a night which is different from all other nights. It's, it's unique. It's disorderly. So then why do we call it order? Why do we call it order when it's the night of disorder? It's the night of the unusual. It's the night of the unexpected. So says the Sfasem is a beautiful answer, which is because for the Jewish people, our order is disorder. Our order is balagat. Why do you think in Israel everything's such a balagat? It's meant to be. That's our DNA. Why that is, by the way, on a very deep level, is to, to get you to trust in Hashem, to get you to rely on Hashem. When everything's going smoothly and calmly, you don't need God in your life. You need Hashem when you've got your PA and everything's going nice and easy. So Hashem likes to like help you have a relationship with him. So he's forever changing. Or as we learned last week, we follow the moon, not the sun, where it's waxing and waning. There's ups and there's downs and there's newness and there's trauma and there's healing and from trauma to healing, trauma to healing. And therefore the nature says the spas MS of the Jew is the unexpected, is, you know what? One o'clock, there was, there was someone that I used to work with that, that used to like meetings like at one o'clock in the morning. I said one o'clock's a great time for a meeting. You know, that, that's, we need to be ready for anything. We need to be ready for anything. That, that is the nature, that's the, that's the rhythm of the Jew. So that's first part. Second part is what is the order itself? So the order is the first 15. That's what we sing at the beginning of Seder night. And there's some people do it to a song. And then to, by the way, the more you can do to tunes and songs, the better. It's quite amazing. The songs like Dayenu, we believe it's the same tune for the past 2,300 years. The Haggadah was written by the men of the Great Assembly. So we're talking about the year 3,500 approximately during Second Temple time. So we've been singing literally, we believe that, for example, Dayenu has been going back. Other some of the songs of Satan has been going for thousands and thousands of years, even older than the Beatles, everybody. So it, it's really going back way 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 back and it's very deep to Hashem wants us to sing we should be joyous that's one of the reasons we love music sometimes you can express more with music than you can express with words so whatever so so the 15 there are 15 phases of the order the order of Seder Kadesh Orchatz Karpas Yachatz Magid Roxa Motsi Matzo Morav Kairach Shulchan Orach Sopen Baruch Halel Nirzai even rhymes how nice is the Balagodot to create even a poem with it so it actually rhymes and this is what we're going to be going through. These are the different stations you're going to be going through on your liberating cathartic freedom experience. Because step number one is to understand the Satan night should not be something boring, something ritualistic, something, oh, it's like a book. You've got to go through a book. I hate books. It shouldn't be that. You are the book. You're going through you. It should be an extremely internal, transformative experience going back to your roots, going back to your childhood. If you don't feel that you've, you've achieved meaning in Seder, like Chaval, you've missed out. And if you feel it's kind of robotic and ritualistic, so don't make it that. Ask questions that interest you. Maybe prepare between now and, and, and Seder, like with some beautiful ideas you've heard and, and write them down. So to make sure the Seder you're going to, you go and give, give, give of that. And critically, we're going to learn, make sure sometime during Satan night, you have your own private prayer with God, where you can start really dreaming for your future. Because my dear friends, however tough your life has been this year, however stressful it's been, however challenging it's been, you have the opportunity to break free from those chains this year. You know the song, I want to break free. So we get a chance to break free. This is literally a chance to break free. Proper freedom. And break free from whatever shackles you've been shackled in. And you might, you might need to label what those shackles are, what your slavery is, what your Egypt is, to then get out of that. But again, we learned that last week. I don't want to repeat. If you're interested in that topic, go back to last week's talk on freedom. For tonight, I want to give you something else. So here we go. Kadesh Orchat, the first two Names of the order is Kadesh or Kadesh, which means Kiddush. We make Kiddush. And then Orchat, we wash our hands. And the mystics ask two questions on those two words. Question number one, normally in life, normally in spirituality, 
we do rachatz and then kiddush. Every Shabbat, a festival, festival, I go to the mikvah. Then I go and have a shower. And then I go into Shabbat. First of all, we clean off and then we get ready for Yom Tov. And then we, then we make Kiddush. I make Kiddush on Friday night after we've had the Rachatz, after we wash. On a deeper level, King David writes in Psalms, the famous line, so tov. We should first of all turn away from bad and then we do good. First of all, before Yom Kippur, in a sense, we did Shabbat. We repent, we say sorry, and then we enter into atonement. Normally, we cleanse off first, we clean first, and then we go. Or to put another analogy, you know, it says, then if you know, when Joseph was out of prison in Egypt, he was actually just prior to Rosh Hashanah, and he comes out before Rosh Hashanah, and they gave him a shave. So I've had a bit of a, a beard trim today, and a bit of a haircut today, getting ready. So. Before Rosh Hashanah, Joseph himself, before he went to Pharaoh, went and got and, and cleaned himself and had a shave and he dressed up well to go and see the king. Normally, if you were going to go and see the queen or the king, you go and get dressed up and be all fancy. On Pesach night, you're essentially going in your prisoner clothes. So one beautiful explanation. In other words, you're not cleaning up first. You're just going straight into Kiddush. Kiddush! And then we'll start talking about our cuts. Then we start changing. Then we start cleansing after you make Kiddush. So one explanation, brief explanation is that it's such a urgent need to get out of Egypt at that very moment. When we came out of Egypt, that's why we have matzah. There wasn't enough time to bake the matzah. We had this such a rush. We were in such a rush because any small delay in Egypt would have led us to have been, God forbid, still, as it says in the Haggadah, we'd still be slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt today. We had to get out there and then. We needed to be faster than time, as Rabbi Tatz calls it. But I really recommend you for Pesach, you listen to his talk, Faster Than Time. I really wanted him to do the talk on, on, on our platform here. Unfortunately, he wasn't well. He's feeling better now, thank God. But Hashem, we, 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 we make plans and Hashem has other plans. But you can listen to it. I'm going to put it on my J Network. Um, station, but if you just go to YouTube and look in faster than time, Rabbi Tatz, you'll hear his amazing, amazing insight into why we have matzah specifically and why we are a nation that has to be faster than time. That's our DNA. But what we're getting at right now is the re one of the reasons why we walk into the king's house with prison clothes on, in a sense. We walk in still spiritually dirty is because Hashem is rescuing us from prison. You have to understand what's really happening on Pesach, my friends. It's not like I'm just going to my friend's house like I normally do every year. Forget about what's going on in the physical world. What's going on in the spiritual, hopefully the emotional world, is your soul has been in prison, in captivity, and Hashem will rescue you from that. But it's got to be quick and it's got to be fast. And Hashem doesn't mind you come in with all the stains. Because this is the night where Hashem is going to rescue you for no reason of your own. It's everybody gets rescued. Everybody gets a free flight. Everybody gets a free flight. What you do with that's going to be up to you. Or well, to go a little bit deeper. As we said, normally we have to remove the bad and then do good. So Rabbi Gottlieb says a very beautiful thing. He says, actually, there's three steps to spiritual growth. Step one is Sadonite. Step one is Hashem swoops in and saves you. Kadesh. When you're going to make Kiddush on Sadonite, as we learned last week, that Arizal says you get a download of expanded consciousness. Even if you don't realize it, it's happening on the unconscious level. You're getting to a place where deep clarity, deep joy. You're literally getting this, this boost, this tremendous booster of God consciousness, which is coming into you. It's called in Kabbalah, Godless the Moichim, coming into you with the first cup of wine. That's Kadesh. And then, then you're meant to then start doing your inner teshuva, even during Pesach, even during the Seder itself, you're meant to do a bit of introspection. You're meant to try and work, take on a Kabbalah. I really recommend this, my friends. Take on, during Pesach nights, if you're listening to this, a Kabbalah, a, a resolution to do something. Maybe a resolution in learning Torah, a resolution in Emunah, a resolution in prayer. Resolution and charity, take on a Kabbalah. The Rav Desla gives the metaphor why taking on a resolution, a 
like a Pesach resolution is so important. He says, it's almost like if you want to climb to the top of a, 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 of a you want to get to the top of a very, very tall hotel, with 50 floors, you can either go up the stairs or you can just press the button and take the lift. He says the Kabbalah is almost taking the lift. When you just make your resolution, when you say, Hashem, Hashem, I'm really going to try and now every day I'm going to say Psalm number 23. That in itself will start shifting your consciousness. That in itself will start you elevating. So it's really important. There should be an element of introspection of, of, of Teshuvah going on during Pesach itself. But essentially what we're saying is this is the Yom Tov of Kadesh Orphat. First of all, you get rescued. Then you start cleaning afterwards. And on a deep level, that means according to Kabbalah, it's the, it's the, the way the Zohar puts it, it's Shusha de la Eilo, and then it's Shusha de la Tato. It's Shusha de la Eilo means you get inspiration from above. It's Shusha de la Tato, it means the inspiration from below. First cup, you're getting, a, you're getting, you're getting moved up. You're, you're going in the lift. Then the rest of the stage, Hashem wants to see you also taking part in trying to get to a higher level of understanding, a higher level of mitzvot. But the first cup is the Kadesh. So that's why we're starting Kadesh or cups. Wow, you're just getting a lift. Even though you don't deserve it at all. We didn't deserve it in Egypt. The men anyway, the women did. The Levian did, but most of the men, absolutely not. Served idols. So that's the first idea of Kadesh or cups. And by the way, that's the Vov. It's very interesting. There's no other Vov. It's Kadesh or cups and then Karpat, Yacha. Magid, I want you, when you're reading the Haggadah, start looking at every word, every letter. Just that Vov in Urchat is fascinating. It's the only Vov in the 15 orders. Why? Because it's juxtaposed to the Kadesh. It's an Urchat only coming from the Kadesh. You're not cleansing from your own exertion. Hashem's, in a sense, cleansing you. Hashem's kind of giving you a bath and, and wiping off your stains for you. It's very deep, but I want you, want you to to look at, at the words and the letters of Seder night. Okay, then next, then we say Kiddush, as we spoke about, you get what's called Godless to Mochin. It's really, it's one of the most important mitzvot of the, the, very quickly, the biblical mitzvahs of Seder night are Kiddush, are Matzah, are Moro, are Benching at the end. And then the rabbinic are gonna be things like the Korach, the, the, the sandwich, the meal, the Hallel, I saw, according to one opinion, there's almost 62 mitzvahs we can do during Seder night. It's probably the holiest night of the year for many, many reasons. One of those, there's so many mitzvahs, so like multi mitzvahs. It's almost like multi vitamins. It's multi mitzvah night. It's an incredible opportunity to do so many mitzvahs. And now, what's really important when you drink the wine, my friends, two things that a lot of people aren't aware of. Number one, you shouldn't just take a sip and put it down. Sorry, you haven't even done the mitzvah there. You need to have what's called rov cost, the majority of the, the cup. And that's why it's really important not to have a very small cup as well. And some people say to nice, they have these like nice, nice little beckers. It's very small. You've got to have a good amount of size. Like, you know, those plastic cups, which you get from the mineral machine, the mineral water. It's got to be at least minimum that size. And then the majority of that is what's called a revius, which is the minimum amount you're meant to have. It, ideally, try and finish the whole cup. It's one night to really like go for it and finish the whole cup of wine. You can have grape juice. I, if I were with you, at least the first cup, try and have wine or at least dilute it with the grape juice. But have an element of wine because there's something more, as I was saying um, earlier, mystical and, and magical about red wine on Seder night. It was what's called Mamte Kadinim. We're trying to sweeten the judgments. Red is referring to Gvura, it's referring to normal judgments and challenges. This is the night we can sweeten the judgments sweeten the, to be mumtik the dinim. So, so we, we have the red wine on Seder night, which makes our life and our challenges much easier during the year. But number one, have enough. Number two, lean to the left. The, the Mishnah says, if you didn't lean to the left, you've got to do it again. So you've got to lean to the left. Now, the reason why, very briefly, is that in, in the times where we wrote the Haggadah, the free person, the way they used to eat in those days, they used to recline on couches. They used to... Um, you literally be lounging around as they ate. That was the symbol of freedom to lounge around. And therefore, even though we, that's not necessarily what, how we do it today, that was how we instituted freedom. So definitely make a difference to, to, to lean to the left, make sure the person next to you on the stage tonight you like, you see your left and 
and it's important that that you really go for it and, and give it a good lean maybe have a pillow really 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 take your time and enjoy it and every time you have the four cups of wine and the matzah we need to lean to the left and if not we've got to do it again so you're making kiddush you're having in mind to to fill the mitzvah and the torah of making kiddush next yachatz so we're going to go kaddish orchatz you wash your hands without a blessing karpas then we have the vegetable you make bread for adama then yachatz we break the middle matzah so i've learned this year something very deep about yachatz which i'm very uh, never learned before which i'm excited about to share with you and it goes like this. The mystics say that the, we have three matzot under the, the challah cloth, the matzah cloth. Hopefully it's not a challah cloth, the, the matzah cloth. And those three matzot, anyone know what the three matzot resemble and personify in Jewish history? So we explain it represents Avraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And the mystics explain the middle matzah, therefore, is the middle patriarch, which is Yitzchak. Now, why? And not only that, mystics explain the Satanites all about Yitzchak. Let's try and understand. Why is Isaac, why is Yitzchak, why is the son of Abraham to do with Satanites? First of all, the numerical value of Yitzchak is 208. And Yachatz is actually the the root of the word Yitzchak. It's got the, all the letters of Yitzchak is in the word Yachatz. So Yachatz is hidden, sandwich, should I say, even though it's not a very Pesach word to say sandwich, right? But it's, it's much as witches, right? In, in the name Yitzchak, Yachatz. Now what's going on? Let's go deep for a second. The mystics explain that Yitzchak, says, says the Ariyah Kadosh, comes back in reincarnation someone else in the Torah called Pinchas. He came back as Pinchas and then Pinchas as a reward for him being zealous comes back as Elijah the prophet, Eliyahu Hanovi. So in fact, Eliyahu Hanovi was a reincarnation of Yitzchak. As you know, Elijah the prophet, Eliyahu Hanovi is a big part of Satanite. The mystics explain just like during Sukkot, we have the Ushbizim, we have spiritual guests who come and sit on every night of Sukkot in the Sukkah. On Seder night, the angel who's with you. On Seder night is Eliyahu Novi. Elijah the prophet's with you. Oh, and you're going to literally pour a cup for him. Some mystics would actually escort Eliyahu Novi out. I mean, please God, the are going to try and do that this year. And have a little walk down the road with him. Because the more you can, and it says it's more important, some tzaddikim could actually see Eliyahu Novi. Not that I'm expecting to see him this year because I'm not holding now. But they say, at least if you believe 100% he's there, that's even more powerful than seeing. So I'm really going to make an effort to believe 100% he's there and, and walk him out. I always try and walk my guests out four steps out the house, which we meant to do, which we learned from Abraham and, and Blinader. That's what I was really reading about this year. Sadiqim used to walk Elio Anovi out the house in four steps. So I think the more we understand he's there now, again, why? Satan acts to do Elijah the prophet. Why is it do with Isaac? Why is it do with Pinchas? So very briefly, it's like this. When we separate the middle matzah, so when we're taking out Yitzchak, there's going to be a smaller piece and a bigger piece. What do we do? Which one do we use? The smaller piece or the bigger piece? So the halacha is you're meant to use the smaller piece for the immediate matzah, and then you keep the bigger piece for the afikoman, for the end of the seder. Afi Koman, that last piece of matzah we have, Kabbalistically is always connected to Mashiach's time, the Messianic times, which is very deep. Means you're meant to be living now with the mindset of Mashiach. Our, our, our heart should be in Mashiach. The Chobetz Chaim had a packed bag under his bed the whole time ready for Mashiach. We should have a, a Mashiach state of mind. And Sadonite is trying to teach you that by putting the bigger piece for the Afikoman because the, the bigger chunk of our mindset should be, ah, if only we had Mashiach's time. What does that mean? The, really, Hashem wants us to live in a redeemed world. We don't want to have wars. The, 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 the wars that we've just now had, the terrorism going on in Israel right now, Hashem Yirachim, Hashem should have mercy, especially on our city. Some of my friends in Tel Aviv, was right, they were right there by the attack last week. I'm on the bit 
We shouldn't have a world where illness and conflict and poverty and pain, and we should already be living in a redeemed world. So we need to get our heads around looking forward to the time when the base Hamikdash is going to be built. Now, therefore, the Satan night, my friends, is the transition from exile to redemption, from slavery to freedom. You put the bigger chunk of matzah aside for the Afikoman, which is some of the clues to how to bring the Shia by starting to live in a messianic world even right now. There was a famous story of, of a great Sadiq living in, in Sfas, who there was a time when they thought Mashiach was there. They thought Mashiach was there. There was this rumor, Mashiach said, Mashiach said. So they went to Menachem Mendel of Vitez, one of the great mystics in Sfas, student of the Baal Shem Tov. And they, they came, knocked on his door, and they said, Rabbi, Rabbi, we're hearing Mashiach say, is Mashiach here? She said, one minute, one minute. Rega achat. And he went and opened up his window in his room. And he put his head out the window, smelt around and said, no, no, sorry, Mashiach's not here. He told them Mashiach's not here. So they started walking away. Then they say, whoa, one minute. Rebbe, why did you open your window? Why didn't you just tell us Mashiach's not here straight away? She says, because in my room, Mashiach's here. Ramachal Mendel Vitez was living in a messianic world in exile. That's one of the levels we're trying to aspire to during at least taste it a little bit on Seder night. It should be peaceful. You should have your phones away. You should have your stresses away. You shouldn't be thinking of work. You should allow Hashem to take you for a ride. A ride to see what it's like when the Shia comes. A ride to see what it's like when you're really accessing your highest potential. So what's it got to do with Yitzchak? The word Yitzchak means he will laugh. He will laugh. That's what he's called. As soon as God said to Abraham, you're going to have a child, Abraham laughed. Literally physically laughed. When Sarah heard she was going to have a child, she physically laughed. They called his name laughter. In fact, Yitzchak, he will laugh. What's so funny about Yitzchak? So again, check out Rabbi Tatz's amazing talk on laughter, where he'll answer this question in 60 minutes. I'll try and do it in 60 seconds. And in short, what is funny about things funny what do comedians do they'll take you along a route where you think it's going in one direction and then they make an unexpected twist and that's funny so there's a guy with a bowler hat with a um, umbrella a very posh guy from the city walking along the street and then i'm going to tell you something now which is really sad but yet you're going to laugh he trips up on a banana peel and falls down and his hat goes flying and his stick goes flying and he ends up on his, on, on his backside. And everyone laughs. Why are you laughing? That's really cruel. Poor guy, he could really hurt himself. But we laugh when there's changes. We laugh when things happen unexpected. We laugh when, when the unusual happens. The mystics explain, that's why we say in Eishas Chayel, Oz Himales Pinu. When we get to the next world, then we laugh. Because that transition and that movement from the physical world to a spiritual world is funny, meaning it's unexpected, it's amazing, and it's a transition. And the, and, and the secret is, Seder night is the night of, of laughter. Seder night is the laughter movement from slavery to redemption, from exile to redemption. It's happening. There's laughter happening. That's one of the reasons why when the three angels come to see Abraham, it was during Pesach. It was just before Pesach, he was preparing to say tonight. And they said, this time next year, your son Isaac will be born. He's born on Pesach. He's born at that time. That's who Yitzchok is. Yitzchok's born with the DNA of transition, of, of moving to the next world, of, of, of being dead while he's alive. That's why he's, he was someone who was resurrected. Hashem told Abraham, kill Isaac. And then he comes back to life. He has to hear some amazing. It's not that the Akedo never happened. The Akedo happened. He killed him according to the Zohar. And then he comes back to life. The word for Yitzchak means Kate, Chai, dead while alive. In fact, the numerical value of Yitzchak is Pinchas with the Yud, 208, which means because Pinchas was the one who, again, never died. Like Elijah the prophet, never died. They actually physically never died, whatever that means. It means they didn't go through the departure halls of death because they were already there. Their, 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 their neshama was floating up and down, up and down. They weren't trapped in this world the way we are. 
So you have to understand that is the secret. We can all have a little taster of what it means to live a Yitzchak type of life, a holy type of life, a life where you're not constrained by what's going on out there. Stop thinking on Saturday night about, oh my gosh, fuel prices are going up. How am I going to afford fuel prices? How am I going to afford this inflation? I'm going to... The award, that's not a time to think of it. It's a time to be free from it all. Time to be free. Time to live a Yitzchok type of life. That's why Yitzchok is the key figure during Seder night. Next, Magid. We come to the climax of the Seder, the most important part of the Seder. The main course, like the food is really not the main course. I think from a lot of people on Seder night, it's like, when, when's the food come? When's the food come? My dear friends, if you really want to do a Seder well, eat beforehand. Not matzah, but have a bit of meal. David, I can see his day, he's coming to me for Seder. David, make sure, David, you eat beforehand, right, in the afternoon. Don't come in hungry, because otherwise you're not going to enjoy Seder, right? Because then you're going to be like, when's it against the main course? We're, there's such a lot to do. We need to free ourselves from Egypt, first and foremost. We need to free ourselves from personal Egypt. And one of the ways we do that is Magid. Magid is talking, talking, communication, therapy. It's the ultimate therapy session, say tonight, as we're going to see soon. Peh, sah, peh means the mouth, sah means the talk. Pesach, through our chattering of our mouth, that's how we're going to get rescued. So it's good to talk, like the old British Telecom advert or, or the Balta Shubha advert, BT, I you know, call it Balta Shubha, right? So talking is good. We're going to talk on Saturday night. And that's going to free us. And that's the fight between Pesach and Paro. Paro means evil mouth. Very important. Don't gossip on Saturday night. Please don't. No Loshanara on Saturday night. No, like, anger and, like, you're angry with that aunt and that cousin and that person. Like, that is not the time. That's the to time. You're a Yitzchak. You're not const You're a new soul that night. You're reborn that night. You understand? We're all going through rebirth. As we said last week, with the seed that's coming out that night. So, so your breakuses of last week, forget about. That's not you anymore. You've moved on. You're a new soul. You're a new person. You're a new opportunity. So we're going to get to Magid. Magid means to talk about the story of Egypt and, and to talk about anything, to be quite honest, to talk about any questions to do with Hashem, to talk about anything to do with your freedom. What is freedom? Let's have discussions. What is freedom? What is slavery? What is emuno? My friends, the Nesiva Shalom, one of my Sadiqim, I learn a lot from his Torah, the Slonim Rebbe. He writes the following, based on the Baal Shem Tov, that Pesach is the Rosh Hashanah for Emunah. It's the new year of Emunah. How much Emunah you're going to have in the year is essentially given to you on Satan night based on how you access it. I really hope you have insights, epiphanies, clarity of where Hashem is in your world. That's why the mitzvah of Emunah in the Torah is based on I am Hashem Mitzvah who took you out of Egypt. Number one of the Ten Commandments. You have to understand the link between Exodus of Egypt and Emunah. You're meant to find God through the Exodus of Egypt story. And as we said, it's not merely looking at the 3,300 years ago Exodus of Egypt story. It's looking through your story of your Exodus, of your personal Egypt, and then seeing Hashem in your life. The Kaddish's lady, Rebbe Yitzchak Badichev, used to say, I like to play hide and seek with Hashem, but I'm really good. I keep finding him everywhere. So beautiful. The idea is so beautiful. My friends, I want you to play hide and seek with Hashem this Seder night and find him. Don't just waste time looking for an afikoma. Find Hashem. Find Hashem in the trauma maybe you've had in your life. Find Hashem in the freedom you've had in your life. Find Hashem in the gifts you've had in your life. Find Hashem in where you are for Seder night. That will be divine providence. You see, we believe in something called Ashkachap. That's it. We believe that everything happens for a reason. No such thing as coincidence. Hashem is the puppeteer orchestrating us around, wanting to really take over, wanting to help us. And we're not letting him half the time. We're like, I've got this. It's on me. I lie. And Hashem's like, okay, you're going to make a right mess of it, but fine. Up to you. In fact, if I can just fast forward a minute, one of the most beautiful things I've learned in this preparation for Pesach, if you just briefly just go to the four sons, if you just fast forward to the four sons, it says the following. Echad chacham, 
ואחד רשע, ואחד תם, ואחד שאינו יודע לשאול. So once again, the verb is so important. By the Chochem, it says, Echad Chochem. But then, the verb by the Russia, the verb by the Tom, the verb by the son that doesn't know how to ask. And I saw the most beautiful, beautiful explanation this year. It just touched my heart. You see, Echad's always referring to Hashem. I want you to see how many times it's going to say Echad in Haggadah. When the men of the Great Assembly who wrote the Haggadah, they're giving you clues to finding Hashem. One of the ways that they hide and seek is whenever it says the words, Echad, it's referring to Hashem. So Echad Chochem, but the Echad Rosha, and God the wicked, and God the simple son, and God the one who doesn't know how to ask, meaning the following. I'll give you a story that happened to me yesterday. One of my friends whose daughter just got engaged, she's now preparing his wedding, he's obviously getting a bit stressed about making the wedding, and he comes up to me and says, Rabbi, how many kids have you already married off? And I said, to be honest, I haven't married off any. Hashem married them off. I wrote a check, but even that, nothing to do with me. That was a blessing that, thank God, there was money in the account. Meaning, how many of you think that you are the cause of your financial story? You are the cause of your health, maybe. You are the cause of where you're living. You are the cause... By the way, sometimes a negative thing. Sometimes you might think you're the cause of the mess you've made in your life. Or you're, you're, you're the cause maybe of some of your trauma. You're the cause of some of your Egypt. I've got news for you. You're not. It was Hashem. Hashem put us in Egypt and he took us out of Egypt. Hashem puts us in trauma and he gives us healing. Hashem decides how much money you're going to earn on the Rosh Hashanah. And that's it. You're not going to get earn a penny more in that year, one way or another. We're not meant to think the echad. We're not meant to think we're partners. We're not meant to think it's me and God. Like we're, we're like we're working together. We're, we're like you know we're the mates. You know we're both. He does a little bit. I'm taking over. That's a low level. It's much better to be the level of the wise. Echad. There's no vol. It's just Hashem, and then you're wise. You're wise when you you just leave it to Hashem. My dear friends, the biggest esach gift I can give to you is if you can really work on a munad Pesach and get to a place where you understand Eino Mubadah, there's nothing else apart from God, and Hashem, let Hashem run things. But what's the litmus test if you've got Emuna? Are you stressing? Are you sleeping badly? If you're stressing and sleeping badly, that means that's a big deficiency in Emuna. If you're really leaving over to Hashem, then you should sleep like a baby. And if you're going to ask, so what am I doing in this world? Very simple. As Talbot and Brachot says, what you're doing in this world is your spiritual arena. I call Bidei Shemayim, Chutz Mira Shemayim. Everything's in the hands of Hashem apart from your spiritual arena, your morality, your ethics. That's down. That's you. For good or for bad. Everything else, how healthy you'll be, how wealthy you'll be, if you're married or not, if you have kids or not. That's down to Hashem, and I've got news for you. Rabbi Nachman says, if only you have real bitachon, real trust in Hashem, leave it to Hashem, you're going to have the most incredible life. Because Hashem can provide better than any of us. But we're just not leaving it to Him enough. So if you really want solutions and salvation and blessings, let go and give it to Hashem. Just give it to Hashem and say, Hashem, you're in control. If during Satan night you could say, Hashem, you're in control. At the end of Satan night, we're going to say, Echod ani yodea. We're going to say, who knows one? Echod ani yodea. It's one of the most powerful, it's the climax of Satan night. Which, by the way, a lot of people don't sing the songs at the end. Shame. It's huge. Spiritually very significant. Try and do this. And to say the words, Echod, one, ani yodea, which means by the end of Satan night, Hashem, I know you. I see you now. I get you. You're really with me. Oh my gosh, you're with me tonight. You're with me tomorrow. You're with me in six months. And therefore, I'm, not, I'm going to stop beating myself up about stuff that's happened because actually that was your test that you put me in this world for. I'm not going to beat myself up anymore because it was you, Hashem. And I'm not going to worry about it and, and panic about it because my salvation is also down to you, Hashem. It's the most liberating, cathartic. And as Rabbi Nachman says, if you have the talking, you have everything. You have everything. And that's one of the goals to try and achieve this stage in life. Few questions to ask you to, to think about during Seder night. Why do we not make a blessing on the Haggadah? We're going to make a blessing on the matzah, a blessing on the four cups of wine. 
blessing on the morrow. We don't make a blessing on the Haggadah. It's a very famous question, something you need to think about during Seder night. Um, I want to share this with you. This is another thing which really touched my heart. I learned today. So just, I'm going to quickly repeat what I said last week a little bit about Holach Ma'anyo, the first. If you quickly go to the beginning of, the, of say, the first part of Magid, we're going to say this is the bread of affliction, which, by the way, is a really bad translation. Ania doesn't really mean affliction. It means poverty. It means, it means if, if Hashem doesn't afflict us. He, he, he gives us challenges. He gives us challenges. So it's the bread of challenges. It's the bread of poverty. On the other hand, it's the bread of, of, of freedom. It's a paradox. The bread itself is a paradox. The, the matzah is a paradox. But then we're going to say, whoever's hungry, let him come and eat. So we said last week, very briefly, I'm going to repeat it. Why are we inviting guests right now? It's too late to invite them. It's a bizarre thing to start the say tonight. And as we said, is the, is, the, is the matzah. So we explained last week from Rabbi Sachs, from the book Primo Levi, if this is a man where Primo Levi says after the Holocaust, the hardest part of Auschwitz was 10 days between when the Nazis left and the Russians came in, when everyone went for a death walk, apart from people like him who was hospitalized. And he was in the hospital and there was no food and there was no power. And he was searching frantically for food. And one day, one of his friends said to him, we have some food, I found some food, come and we want to share it with you. And the moment they said, we want to share it with you, he realized now I'm free, meaning the, the fact that we can share is the DNA of the Jewish people. This is a really important point. The beginning of Seder night, we, we declare Am Yisrael Chai, who we are as the people, the people who share. And sharing enables us to be free. I learned something amazing today from the Lubavitcher Rebbe. The Rebbe asked the question, he says, why is your heart on your left side? Normally the right in Kabbalah is chesed, is kindness, is compassion. The heart normally is what signifies compassion. The left is justice, is toughness, is you take away with your left hand, you give with your right hand. So why is the heart on the left? Good question, the Rebbe asked. And he answered the most beautiful answer. So beautiful. Because when I'm facing you, it's on the right side. Who you're facing, it's the right side. Says the Rebbe, your heart wasn't given for you. Your heart was given for others. Your heart was given for how you interact with other people. To do chesed, to do kindness, that's why we're here in this world. Olam chesed If you've got mercy and compassion and sympathy, don't just be selfish with it. Share it. Your heart's called for the one that's to the right. Right now, I'm opposite you. It's, it's, it's my heart's to your right, not to mine. It's very deep. The hearts for another. And that's what we start with Seder night. And that's one of the reasons why there's no blessing on Magid, because Magid is a, is a mitzvah which is meant to be interactive, which is meant to be done together, meant to be done sharing. And by the way, it's important if you're making a Seder to let other people speak, to let other people read parts of the Agadah, let people feel that they're really part of it. David, you can prepare something to even ask or say if you want to, if you've got some nice ideas you want to share, tell your friends. If they've got things to, to contribute to the Seder night, please, please do. It's, it's Seder's for everybody, not just for the host. It's everybody. Everybody's equally needs to feel they're giving, they're getting out, they're, they're contributing. And that's one of the reasons there's no blessing, because any mitzvah, between man and man, you don't make a blessing. For example, when I give charity, I make no blessing. When I honor my parents, I make no blessing because it involves someone else. So sins, muggers, involves other people. That's one of the reasons, my friends, why there is no blessing. I just want to do a bit of a psychological reason, if that's all right. If we can just move it into a bit of psychology now. It's an amazing book that I've just discovered that I'm using for my clients in coaching. It's called It Didn't Start With You by Mark Wallin. And it's an amazing thing. It's like a, a non-Jewish book and a, a, a non-Jewish uh, concept. But then all of a sudden, I find Jewish stuff in it. And, and I found the most amazing concept. There's a professor of psychiatry called Rachel Yehuda, born in Israel. Then she went off to um, a hospital, Mount Sinai Hospital in, in America. And she's come up with the most amazing thesis. And the question, my friends, really from Seder night is, why are we speaking about, we asked the question, what's different from all other nights? 
What's unique about Seyed and I? We answer Abadim Hayinu. We were slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt. We start talking about our ancestors' slavery. I've explained to you that Satanite's more about you releasing from your bondage, from your slavery. Why do you have to go back and look at your great, great, great grandparents that you never met 80 generations back? Why is that going to release you from your slavery? So Rachel Yehuda explains that there's something out there which is called the following. It's called epigenetics. You ever heard of epigenetics? Epigenetics is very interesting. DNA, only 2% of our DNA contributes to our physical looks. 98% of our DNA goes for everything else. And she explains that when our parents and grandparents and great grandparents go through certain ordeals and challenges, somehow it's in our genes. As David said, there's genetic memory. It's in our genes. And, and the way she really worked it out, there was a patient she had called Gretchen. This lady called Gretchen, after years of taking antidepressants, she had terrible depression, anxiety. She tried every type of therapist, sessions, nothing was helping. And at a certain point in the session, Gretchen said she didn't want to live anymore. And then she said the strange word. She said, I'm done. I've had enough. I want to be vaporized. I want to be vaporized. I'm going, I'm going to kill myself. I'm going to be vapor she used this very strange word for suicide called vaporized. And the doctor said straight away, this is a bit weird. And the doctor said to her, let me ask you a question. Do you have any great grandparents or grandparents who went through the Holocaust? So Gretchen said, I'm not sure, but the truth is there's a story about my grandmother. She'd been born, she was Catholic, Gretchen, but she heard that the grandmother was born from a Jewish family in Poland. And, and when she came to the United States in 1946, that she married Gretchen's grandfather, meaning, yeah, the grandmother's whole family had perished in the ovens in Auschwitz, and they were vaporized, incinerated. And, and the more Gretchen spoke about it, she got very emotional. And the psychiatrist did the following exercise to, to help her deepen her understanding she was invited to stand in her grandmother's shoes and imagine what it was like for her grandmother in Auschwitz. And she said, can you literally, literally stand in the footprints of your grandmother? Literally imagine that you're in her body. Like try and go back. And Gretchen reported sensations of overwhelming loss and grief, aloneness and isolation. But then she started feeling better. Her body started moving to a, to a to a phase of healing. And I'm thinking as a result of epigenetics, which by the way, Carl Jung, the famous Carl Jung says this line, I feel strongly that I'm un under the influence of things or questions which were left incomplete and unanswered by my parents and grandparents. It often seems as if there is an impersonal karma within a family, which is passed on from parents to children. It always seemed to me that I had to complete or perhaps continue things which previous ages had left unfinished. That's his quote. And what I'm saying is something very deep. Perhaps one of the reasons we're saying Abodim Hayinu is we're going back to our roots and that's going to help liberate us. We're going back to our genetic roots of one of the reasons we go through the trauma we go through in our world. And that's why many psychiatrists and therapists will say, tell me about your childhood. But now we're going a little bit deeper. Let's go back. You have to understand the Jewish people, my friends, a part of a 3,800 link of a chain from Abraham. And sometimes when we're just able to really understand the part of a big hole and we go back to thinking about what it was like coming out of Egypt, that's going to help you on a very deep level get out of your own Egypt. Something to think about. Something really quite exciting. Finally, Manishtana Halayla Azeh. Manishtana Halayla Azeh. Why is this like different famous song? Manishtana Halayla Azeh. The Vilna Gons is something very deep. Manishtana Halayla Hazer. Really, it should have said Halayla Zot. Lila's feminine. Zot is feminine. Grammatically, it seems wrong. It should say Manishtana Halayla Hazot, says the Vilna Gons. Why does it say Manishtana Halayla Hazer? Says the Vilna Gons, that's the question. The question is Manishtana Halayla Hazer. That's what the, that's what the Vilna Gons says, James. With, with, with the hay, that's what he says. You can argue with the girl. 
But he explains like this. Listen, listen to this, everybody. Night is normally the moon. The difference between the moon and the sun is the moon takes and reflects the light of the sun, explains the Bilmi Gaon. Sun has its own light. Moon is merely a reflective light reflecting back to the sun. An evening normally doesn't have unique energy. That's why we, not, we don't normally say halal at night. We can only say halal in the morning when we're creating our own energy. Seder night is the unique night of all the nights of the year. When you can say halal, we say halal at night with a blessing because the light coming from the moon on Seder night is sunlight, not moonlight. Meaning, as we said earlier, you're going to get a lift like a daylight lift. There's an amazing Midrash that says, listen to this, this is life-changing, everybody. That says, Esther and Mordechai, when, when they knew that Haman was going to kill us, and they were trying to work out a plan of what to do. It already happened like a year, year earlier. They made the decision that after the lottery was made, when they had a year to prepare, on 15th of Nisan that year, they were going to fast during Satan. And, and the tzaddikim asked, why did they decide that Seder night they're going to be their fast day and their teshuva day? Rosh Hashanah was coming up. Yom Kippur was coming up six months later. You had time before Adar. You would have thought they would have gone all in on Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur. That should have been the day to really beg Hashem to reverse the decree. Explains the tzaddikim. They knew the secret. The Seder night is even more powerful. If you really understood the potency and the power of Seder night, you wouldn't go to sleep Seder night. That's why the night, we don't have to say Kriyat Shema. You don't have to say the Shema before you go to sleep because there's Lel Shimurim. It's the night of protection. My dear friends, my biggest gift I give to you is the following. Sometime on that Seder night, it could be when everyone leaves because you might not want to do it in front of people. Make prayers. It's the night when you can literally revoke and destroy and annul decrees that have been made against us, which isn't going well. If you feel there's aspects in your life which is super challenging, which is hard, that is the night to beg Hashem, to really dub into Hashem, to make those Kabbalah, to make those resolutions. I want to grow. I want to take on new things. Carpe diem sees the day, but this is sees the night. Really sees the night. It's a night unlike any other night. No other night is like it. It's a night which is like a day. It's a night which is like Yom Kippur during the day. It's an incredible. And Mordechai and Esther understood that. And that's why that's the night they said that's the way to, to destroy Homon's decree. Because that's the night more than any other period during the year where Hashem will rescue you and take you out of, 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 of our issues and our problems, and, and of our slavery. <sighs> so much to say, what can I tell you? I don't even know where to begin, where to end, because I could, Steve, as Dave is gonna find out, I could speak for four hours on Saturday night. So there, there, there's, he, he's not gonna come now, right? We, we, which there's so, there's so many, uh, James definitely will come. There's so many amazing parts of Satan. I'll just leave you with maybe a few questions to explore, number one. Why is Moshe Rabbeinu's name not mentioned in Agada? We're going to speak about Abraham's father, Terah. We're going to speak about literally Uncle Tom Cobley and all. We're going to speak about everybody, but the prince of Egypt, the main man in the story, we're not going to mention Nagada. In fact, it's in the book, but not during the story of Magid. Homework for you is to find out when Moshe's name is mentioned and why it's not mentioned there. And, and why is it not mentioned in the narrative of going out of Egypt? Can you imagine you're making a film, The Prince of Egypt, you're not going to speak about the prince. It's unbelievable, but... That's something for you to think about why we don't do that. Another thing to think about is why we're very naughty to the, to the four sons. First of all, ask yourself who you think you are of the four sons. Because actually some say the Sha'ina Yodeh Lishol, the one who doesn't ask, is actually the highest one. Because he has such level of faith, he has got no questions. Got no questions, it's all good. It's all good. I have questions, Hashem. I love you. I know you love me. It's all good. Some say he's even higher than the wise one. But the question I want you to, to grapple with is why we're so harsh to the Rasha. We knock the teeth out the Rasha. We, we resort to physical violence. When the wicked person asks this question, we say, knock his teeth out. That seems very un-Jewish, 
right? You've never met, hopefully, a rabbi or a Chabad rabbi who's going to do that for someone that, you know, asks a tough question, let come beat him up. How can we do that? Surely that's un-Jewish. And not only that, if you read the story of what the wise person says, what the wicked person says, it almost, they say the same thing almost. So really what I'm asking you to do is when you go through the Haggadah and say tonight, don't just kind of, especially at the beginning when you've got energy, really try and think through it and try and every word in Haggadah is critical. Every letter is critical and see if you can spot some clues, some secrets, which are in here because there's tremendous secrets. And these, these secrets are, will free you from your own exile and from, from your own slavery but because it's just critically i suppose it's most important dayenu at the end is very important dayenu and nirza one of the most important ways to become free is gratitude that's why there's a lot of gratitude during the dayenu it would be enough for us if you'd have taken us to sinai but not giving us the torah if you think about it, it makes no sense what's the point of that that's an anti-climax you wouldn't have had a torah but the whole point of dayenu is whatever you do for hashem is enough for us we're not being some like some self-entitled spoiled brat. That no, it's not good enough. You know, I'm not happy with this. The whole point of Dayenu is you're free when you when you have appreciation. Really deep idea. The more you appreciate, and really the climax in the end is the first cup. Hashem's raising you, but then the second cup is is with Magid. So now we're we're talking about the story. You're, you're journeying out of slavery. Then we're eating. We're physically nourishing ourselves to to marry the physicality and really appreciate him for the food. And then finally, we say thank you to Hashem. And only when we have gratitude, then we have the fourth cup. And we're going to do three things. We're going to say dayenu. We're going to do grace after meals. And we're going to say halal. So there's a tremendous amount of gratitude going on because then you're ready to be free. And if you think about it, I know people that they get depressed and they're stressed. When they get to a place of real appreciation, I tell people to have affirmations every day, like write a gratitude, gratitude journal. Try it for anyone who's never done it. Every day, just write down what the things to be grateful for. And before you know it, all of a sudden, you're smiling every day. Because Hashem says, oh, you want to say thank you to something? Let me give you more to say thank you for. And it happens that becomes this ripple effect of appreciation and gifts and appreciation and gifts. And that's one of the clues going on on Seder night. Just a brief answer for why Moshe Rabbeinu is not mentioned. And then I'm going to go. Because Moshe Rabbeinu is not mentioned because he's so humble. And because he didn't want to be mentioned, because he was, it wasn't about him. As we said, it's a night about Emunah. It's, it's, it's a night about Hashem's running the show. So the last thing Moshe Rabbeinu wants is for us to think, but Moshe paid a big part as well. He helped us. He was literally a vessel that Hashem worked through. The microphone doesn't get excited and says, no, no, it's about me. When, when, when someone's speaking through a mic, what about me? It's Mike doing the work. No, it's not. He's just the microphone. Moshe Rabbeinu is the microphone. Our job is to learn to be Hashem's microphone, to be Hashem's vessel. And that's when incredible light can come through. I give you all a blessing that you'll all have a tremendous kosher Seder night where you'll be able to fulfill the mitzvahs. You'll be able to feel tremendous happiness. You'll be able to get out of your personal Egypt and be able to, please God, all together, really have a Yitzchak night of a messianic evening, which will conclude, we'll wake up in the morning, and we'll find out Mashiach's come, and we'll all finish off, please God, any rebuilt Jerusalem.